Welcome, dear listeners, to Horror Den of Misfits. Story time. Several years ago, I went on a road trip through California, and at times, I found myself boondocking on public lands in order to save money. Anyway, on one particular night during my trip, I decided to boondock in Death Valley where I experienced something quite scary, that I'll never forget. I started my trip out in Joshua Tree National Park, reaching Death Valley about three weeks later. I arrived in Death Valley around 5 p.m. and immediately found a spot where I wanted to park for the night. For some odd reason though, the place wasn't found on any map, so I looked for any clue as to where I was, but only found a sign that said Camp 13. Regardless though, I was happy because I had the place all to myself, or so I thought. It appeared to be an old mining town and remarkably though some of the buildings were still standing and it felt so serene. Towards the edge of town though, there was an entrance to a mine shaft which had been boarded up, for what seemed like a while. You could actually hear the wind blowing through the mine which gave me the creeps. After I parked my BTUP RV in the spot I chose, I let my two huskies out to play then I began preparing dinner. By the time dinner was ready it was already dark, but fortunately for me the sky was clear, so I was able to gaze out at the stars as I ate my dinner. As I sat there staring out into the night sky, I could hear my dogs barking frantically. Looking over in their direction I noticed that they were very close to the boarded up mine shaft. Fearing for their safety, I called out their names and at first, they didn't respond. Something must have spooked them badly I thought. Once again, I called out to them and this time they came running back to me. It was at this point I noticed that something else was with my dogs. Although it was dark, the moon gave off just enough light so that I could make out a human-shaped figure. My first thought was that it was some homeless person taking refuge in one of the buildings, but boy was I wrong. I quickly stepped inside my RV and grabbed the gun which I kept hidden under the driver's seat. I ran over to my dogs, but by the time I got there, the creature was already gone. I grabbed my dogs and made my way back to the RV. Just as I closed the door, something slammed into us causing the RV to shake. My dogs then started to growl at the door and that's when I heard something scraping the outside of the RV, like the sound of nails against a chalkboard. The sound made my dogs go crazy. As I tried calming them down, there was a loud thud on top of the roof and I could hear the thing growling as it made its way towards the skylight. I quickly made my way to the rear too and when I was directly under the spotlight, I aimed my gun upwards. What I saw though, is something that I'll never forget. The creature was covered in a brown fur and it had a long snout much like a dog's, but longer. The thing's teeth appeared to have blood on them like it just feasted on some poor animal and it had canines, which were at least an inch long. Its eyes though were the scariest as they were glowing like bright yellow lights. The creature snarled at me as it tore away at the skylight trying to make its way inside. I steadied myself as I carefully pulled the trigger, hitting the creature and causing it to howl in pain. This was my cue to leave, as I jumped into the driver's seat put the key into the ignition, and sped off, even leaving some of my camping gear behind. The next day I contacted the sheriff from the next town over and by some miracle, I was able to find the old mining town. As we entered the town I could see that my gear was strewn about and there were bloody footprints that seemed to lead back to the mine shaft. Oh, there was some fur found near my belongings in which the sheriff took some samples, he then took down my statement and said he'd contact me if anything else came up. So here's a warning to anybody wanting to boondock in Death Valley, if you happen to run across an old mining town called Camp 13, please don't stop or you might not be as lucky as me. I never believed in ghosts or spirits before. I always enjoyed reading about scary stories but I was always a skeptic. But after today, I can confidently say that I do believe in spirits and in evil. After speaking to my dad about this incident with my two younger brothers, he's convinced me to write about our story and post it onto Reddit for, hopefully, some answers. 
I'm sorry if this is poorly written but I'm trying to vent about the occurrence while it's still fresh in my mind. It happened about two hours ago. My family and I are actually currently on a road trip from Florida to Wyoming. Today, however, we decided to set up camp at a secluded, backwooded RV camp in the wilderness by a lake. Only one other RV was parked here and it was all the way on the opposite side of the lake. When we first got here, we were looking around at the area and I immediately noticed the beautiful rocks and minerals all over the place. There were so many. I then noticed a picture-perfect bundle of wheat lying on the ground. I looked online at what it is called, and it says it is called a sheaf. Well, I thought it looked nice and my dad told me to keep it and put it in the RV as a keepsake. About three minutes later, my youngest brother, Joe, 12, came to me and told me that he found some bones by a tree. I was immediately concerned and followed him to the bones. Sure enough, there was a bone about the size of my forearm that looked a lot like a dog bone out of a cartoon and a couple of other skull-like bones, not human skull, beside it. Mind you, these bones were in no particular formation just in a pile. It didn't look as if it was a complete set of bones. And they were not human bones. At least not that I know of. I'd also like to add that the bones had no sort of remains on them. Just bone. My other brother, John, 13, then came over to us and noticed the bones as well. It was extremely creepy. I had walked away and so did Joe but while we were gone, John moved one of the bones around with his shoe which immediately worried me. We left the area and began to just relax with family for a while. We also took a trail behind where the RV was parked. It was a nice half mile trail but very much in the wilderness. Later, we noticed that the sun was setting and the fireflies were coming out so we decided to take the trail once again but this time at sunset. We were having a great time and finally came to the point where we have to choose to take a left, right or continue forward. We were standing there for at least a minute discussing what we should do. I had a bad feeling and told my brothers, I really don't want to continue forward or walk to the right. It's an unknown area that we haven't done. Joe replied, yeah. John was spinning in a circle for fun. We then heard a noise like a screech. Joe said quietly, what was that? Not even five seconds went by and we then heard a screech like growl. It was not a human sound. Joe immediately bolted back to the RV and shouted, run. And me and John stood there two more seconds as we both saw with our own eyes a figure about six tall, a wide build, and something in front of it which looked like a claw. A claw the size of a human head. I described it as the ends of a Native American's feather crown on their head. It was Edward Scissorhands like. Anyway, the thing seemed to be gliding or riding something up the hill to the right where I didn't want to go in the grass on the hill. It looked like a black shadow. Mind you, all of this happened literally within a 10 seconds time span. From the first growl to the second and to the figure moving. John and I immediately bolted behind Joe back to the RV. I have never been so afraid for my life. I ran like the wind. So fast that I thought I'd die from tripping down the hill. As we're running back, John is shouting at me, that was probably just dad. It's just dad I kept yelling no it wasn't and cussing like crazy out of fear. We arrived to the RV and the first person we saw was my dad. The figure wasn't my dad. We hysterically were laughing and breathing. We were laughing because we couldn't believe we were alive and made it back to the RV and couldn't believe what we had just witnessed. We will never forget this occurrence and are still very much haunted by it. We were all alone in the wilderness. Our theories are that we upset some Native American spirit and that it wanted us away from its land. We also think that maybe it was because we disturbed items used for witchcraft by a stranger. Our last theory, strongly believed by my two brothers, is that it was a skinwalker. We don't think it was a bear because of how loud and screechy the growl was. It seemed as if it were right in our ears even though the figure was several feet in front of us. Plus, the way it was moving was not bear-like. All we know is that we're terrified and will never think the same after this. We've learned our lesson about respecting items that aren't ours. And land that isn't ours.
We just want to see if anyone on Reddit can give us any information on what they think it could have been. Or simply getting some comfort from others would be nice. We're currently wide awake here in the RV. First, here is some backstory. For the biggest part of my life, I lived in Greece and I recently moved to Canada. In Greece we don't have tales of skinwalkers or any other sinister being so if I say something incorrect, it's probably because I lack information and knowledge. I started riding my motorcycle to Ontario at around 10 pm, a 7 hour trip from where I lived. Roughly halfway through the trip, I guess at around 1 am, the fuel tank was empty. Now I need to note that I was sure I had a full tank before leaving, so this was very weird. I called 911 since I didn't know who to call at that point and the dispatcher said that although I shouldn't call for this kind of issue, she'd send someone to help me. I apologized and thanked her. The place I was stopped was a straight road with trees on each side. A forest. I was near French River Provincial Park. When the conversation ended, I noticed something extremely weird. Silence. Extreme silence, as if everything around me had died. The crickets that were previously getting on my nerves, had stopped. The owls were nowhere to be heard. Then I heard a dog crying from inside the woods. It was extremely distinct since it was the only thing I could hear. Since I love dogs, I slowly and hesitantly started making my way inside the woods to see if that dog was hurt. I was approaching. I could hear the crying louder with each step. Then I stopped. The crying was now taking place in front of me. But then it stopped and instead of crying, the sound that I could hear now was an aggressive growl behind me. I turned around and saw it. It was not a dog, not a wolf, not a bear, in fact, it wasn't anything animal-like. It was a seven-something foot tall thing with a dog face and extremely sharp teeth. I literally crapped my pants. My survival instinct kicked in and I immediately started running back to my motorcycle. I was crying as a result of being so terrified. I finally made my way back to the road and saw a fire truck and two firefighters. They asked me if I was okay but I couldn't say a word. I was shivering. When I was finally able to talk I told them everything. They said that this was a common thing there and that rangers had been looking for that thing for more than a decade. They checked my bike and when they looked at the tank they saw claw marks all over it and spilled fuel. They took me with them and helped me with my motorcycle. I am completely traumatized and I still can't explain what I saw. That's the reason I share this story with you. To see if anyone else had any similar experiences. I was recently driving late at night in the Rocky Mountains in Colorado. I live 30 miles south of Alamosa, Colorado. I was driving on a back road with my buddy taking him home near my house. It was about 12 am. Out of nowhere, this thing appeared in the headlights in the middle of the road. It was crouching over some roadkill. It was humanoid. It was pale and looked like it had no ears. It looked like a windigo from until dawn. It was 7 feet tall with abnormally long arms. No nose and nasty teeth. It wasn't skinny but its skin was tight with ribs visible with long claws on the end of its hands. I was barely able to dodge it with my truck as I was driving considerably fast. As I swerved around it, it seemed like time slowed down. It looked up from the roadkill it was eating and stared at me as I passed. Its eyes were yellow. I immediately hit the brake and yelled at my friend, WTF. Did you see that? His eyes were wide with fear and he nodded at me. I threw the truck in reverse, but when I approached the roadkill it was gone. My friend claims to have seen it too, so I know I'm not crazy. When I was a kid I read a lot of stories about the rake. I know the rake isn't real so maybe they invented a creature that already existed? Maybe it's a cave creature like in the descent? I need answers. This happened in 2005. I used to be a garbage man. So in 2005, I used to have a garbage route over in Indiana in Dearborn County. 
It was a state route that ran parallel to the Ohio River. So this one morning, it's just before sunlight but it's enough light where, just before dawn, you know, just enough light so it's not dark. I'm dumping some trash and I look, something's catching my eye a quarter mile up the road. I hear a deer running out of the clearing coming towards the road. So I'm looking at him and I've hunted before so I know what it looks like when a deer is being driven. As it approaches this state route, it's not so much busy, but it's like a 60 mile per hour route, so traffic when it comes, comes fast. So these deer, when they get to the road, they cross the road with no regard for traffic. So I think, they are more scared of whatever is chasing them than getting hit by a car. So, I'm looking at the deer, and out of the corner of my eye again, I see the trail of deer. And I see something coming out of the woods chasing it and you know how, when you see things that you don't know, your mind tries to rationalize what you're seeing. So I'm seeing this. Ah, huge black creature chasing this deer and I'm like, okay, that's a bear. But bear don't run on two feet. So, just as they get to the edge of the road, it swipes and clips the back of this deer and sends it like, like a helicopter. It knocked this deer clear across the road. I'm still dumping trash and the way this road is, it's kind of an undulating road so it's just over a rise and I can see maybe waste up what's going on. So it takes me maybe about 5 or 10 more minutes to work a couple more trash stops to come over that rise and see. So I pull over to the side of the road and I see a fat, dead deer with his neck twisted like a dish towel. The neck had been broken and one of its hind quarters was missing like a Thanksgiving turkey. Like how you would just take a turkey's leg, except it had taken the hind quarters out of the socket like it was a turkey leg. You know what, I'm very into nature and I'm mad at myself because if I had the understanding and I knew what I was watching. I mean, I had one of those, what do they call it? a life-altering experience and I'm mad that I couldn't appreciate it because my mind dismissed it as being something else. It just goes to show you, believe what you see. Just because you don't hear about something or you don't believe it, believe your eyes. My sighting occurred southeast of our cabin near Danbury, Wisconsin. The cryptid was very wolf-like and it definitely was not a bear as well as I'm pretty sure wolves don't run upright. So I was 17 at the time. It was midsummer and we were at our cabin in northwest Wisconsin. I was with my cousin and grandparents for the weekend. I brought along my airsoft gear. So I and my cousin are in a mid-airsoft battle, I took it more seriously than him. I was decked out in full BDU woodland camo, including the Shemog. I retreated into the forest for better tactical advantage. So the way our land was set up is there is a trail that cuts around the border of the almost acre of owned forest. Our skirmish took us about 200 meters into the woods going up the right trail. So I'm a huge outdoorsman. I was introduced to hunting and survival training as well as firearms at a young age. I also had been practicing MMA for a few years at that point. The point is I'm not easily scared, and I'm comfortable in the wild. Now I'm 25 and have even more training. I respect the wild a lot more now. I was cocky back then. Anyway here is where things get strange. Our battle had ended and we were standing at the edge of a slightly clearer area of forest and just talking. On the other side of the clearing is a hill that goes down to a small pond. Animals are a common sight around there as it's a watering hole. Now as any experienced outdoorsman will know most small animals will go about their business even when humans are around, birds will still chirp and whatnot. But when a big predator is around the forest goes dead quiet. So me and my cousin are talking and I decided to freak him out. So I shushed him and whispered, we're being watched. He got quiet. Then I realized that it was dead quiet, not even birds chirping anymore. Then I got that feeling. You know, when you feel like you are being watched. I went into hunter mode at this point and started scanning the clearing. I went from right to left then back. On the second look through I saw it. Its teeth are what gave it away as they contrasted with the background. Once I focused on it I noticed a canid appearance in the head. It had dark reddish brown hair or fur. 
Where it gets even stranger is it was leaning on a tree and had its front left arm gripping the tree. It appeared to have claws, and it was panting and staring in our direction with its ears up listening while kneeling or crouching. I recognized it as a threat, as a predator immediately. Now this all happened in the span of maybe 10 seconds before I said to my cousin we have to go. He was a faster runner than me. When I said that I was still watching the animal, my cousin took off. When he ran, the animal raised up and ran towards us. It took a good three steps on two legs before I started to run, as I was turning to run it appeared to have possibly been going to all fours. I got to the fork in the trail to find my cousin waiting. I yelled go go. And we ran back to the cabin. While running out I could hear it crashing through the woods behind me, but it didn't follow beyond the tree line. At the time I thought it had the intention to do harm, but now that I look back on it, I think it was just being either territorial or it was a bluff charge. Most animals can easily outrun humans on foot. If it really wanted one of us it would have got us. I have tried to explain it away as being a bear or a big wolf, but what I saw just does not add up. It just wasn't a known animal. I'm still stumped by it. I was recently added to a group of people who have had similar sightings. They say mine falls in line with other sightings. They believe it to be a dogman which I think is the cheesiest name they could have chosen, but I admit that what I saw is very similar if not the same as what others have claimed to see. I have different theories regarding the creature though. I am normally very skeptical. However, I know that what I saw was not normal, and I am less skeptical than I used to be now. I am still nervous about the forests. I don't go into the woods alone or unarmed anymore. I'm not scared of any man but I certainly don't want to see anything that looks like a werewolf again. By the way, all of this happened in broad daylight if it wasn't clear. I lived in Montana on some land my dad owns and I was hiking up a mountain, Bighorn Mountain Range, like most days. I heard this really weird screaming coming from the other side of the mountain, away from my house and deeper into the woods. It wasn't a mountain lion, too deep and long, went on for about 10 seconds, and I'm pretty sure it wasn't a bear. It kind of sounded like a human, except it was distorted. It sounded like someone was possessed by something, sort of like what you'd hear in a horror movie. I got to the top of the mountain, pulled out my binoculars, and looked in the general direction of the scream. I saw a weird humanoid looking creature. It was as pale as paper, didn't have any hair or clothes, or genitals, and its arms were longer than its body. It also had huge black eyes that covered most of its face. It was walking, but as soon as I saw it, it stopped and stared at me. I watched it carefully for at least two minutes. I remember thinking it staring straight into my soul. I had to look away because my eyes had started watering from not blinking. When I looked back at it after wiping my eyes, it was gone. I couldn't see it anywhere, which made me think it was a weird hallucination or something. Illusion or not, I decided to get the hell away from the area and ran back home. The scariest part is that 5 minutes after I walk in the door, I hear the scream again. It was much closer and made my ears ring. Now that I think about it, I remember that I could hear my dad yell at me whenever he needed help with something every other time I was up there. I'm pretty sure it was where I was standing when I first saw it. My dad heard it too, so it wasn't just some hallucination, and my neighbor was talking about the screams a week after it happened. I've researched it as best as I could but never found anything fitting its exact description. I've never seen it since. My dad hasn't either. It's one of the many reasons I moved in with my mom in Arizona. If anyone has ever driven in Alabama, then you know it can be a creepy state to drive through. I'm not sure where to start. I have had a few experiences with the paranormal but this is my only cryptid experience. I'm not sure what we witnessed, but we got a good look at it in broad daylight. The sighting happened just before noon. My girlfriend and I had some time off work so we decided on a much needed getaway for a long weekend. This was early winter 2020, 
so it was pretty darn cold. That being said, if you know anything about the US South it doesn't get that cold. This was one of those rare days when it was 30 or 40 degrees Fahrenheit range. I'm just trying to compile all the events surrounding the sighting so bear with me here. We were on a highway in a swampy area. I have no idea the exact location, but I can say it was southern Alabama and close to Mississippi. There were lots of bridges. I wish we could have gotten pics, but the car was moving around 60 miles per hour when it happened. My girlfriend cries out for me to look and I turn my head to glimpse a grotesque creature. This thing was hunched down on all fours possibly eating something. This all happened so fast, but I slowed down to get a better look. All of a sudden the thing stands on two legs and has a humanoid figure, all except the head. The head was goat-like, but it had the body of a man. There were horns, and over all the head area resembled a light-colored goat. The creature started back towards the woods, and we continued with our trip, but we couldn't stop talking about what we had just witnessed. I cannot be 100% sure of what we saw, this all happened so fast. My girlfriend swears it was a man with a goat head and I am certain I saw the same thing. If anyone has any insight into cryptids of this type or a similar sighting I'd be glad to hear. Stay safe out there. I received a beautiful four-poster bed from my grandparents when they passed away. It had intricate carvings and a dark reddish-brown color. However, my apartment was small, and the bed took up too much space, so I decided to sell it. I posted an ad on Craigslist after researching its potential value. A few days later, a young couple interested in the old-fashioned style and dark wood contacted me. They offered a good price, and we arranged for them to see the bed in person. Upon inspection, they liked it even more and gave me a cashier's check for the full amount. Despite the sentimental value, I let go of the bed, trusting the couple would appreciate it. On the scheduled pickup day, they arrived with a truck, and we worked together to load the heavy bed. Afterward, I felt a sense of closure but later received a message from the couple. They were struggling to assemble the bed, specifically with one post that was loose. Despite my initial assistance, they reached out again, claiming the bed was moving and vibrating on its own. Feeling uneasy about their requests, I visited their home again. I discovered the issue was simply loose bolts and tightened them. However, their subsequent messages raised suspicions, and I chose to ignore them. The guy persisted with demanding and annoyed texts, prompting me to block his number. That evening, I heard knocking at my door around midnight, and to my surprise, it was the same guy. I became alarmed and called the police, fearing for my safety. The police arrived and, after questioning us, concluded it was a personal dispute. The couple accused me of selling a broken bed, but the police advised them to pursue legal action if they believed it was a scam. I never discovered their true intentions, but the incident taught me to be cautious with strangers and trust my instincts. I'm 43 years old, married for 15 years, and my sex life is terrible. For the sake of the internet, my name will be Jean. My husband, Casey, works in finance. I met him at my sister's engagement party and he happened to be one of the groomsmen. He asked me if I wanted to see the latest Guy Ritchie film with him and I love all Guy Ritchie films, so I said yes. We had sex on our second date and it was terrible and he was oblivious. Lots of guys are terrible at sex. I liked being around him and he made me feel good about myself, so I stayed with him, thinking he'd eventually get good at it, even though he definitely wasn't equipped with the largest package I'd ever seen. For a while, the sex was okay. But after we were married, Casey became progressively lazy, and now he's very proud of his teddy bear bod which is more or less a shorter hairier Homer Simpson. Casey used to be an amateur swimmer with a wicked six-pack. He stopped swimming several years ago, reasoning that our sex life was good enough exercise to keep him in shape. He's fat and bald, we have three kids, and I haven't experienced a coital orgasm since I was 24 years old 
very close to half my life ago. His personality is great, he gets invited to exciting work parties that are always fun, but he always wants to leave early so he can bang me, only he rolls his keg of a belly over me for three minutes and passes out in a sweaty heap. I've tried being on top, on my knees, and other things I won't write about here. Nothing works. Sometimes, I'll be able to bring myself close to climax through my own movements but then he comes and immediately exits me and my evening is ruined. So I put an ad on Craigslist and lied about my age, bored 39 year old wants a one night stand with a 7 inch stallion, and fairly flattering pictures of my ass and tits. Dudes don't care a whole lot about perfection when they know they're going to get laid without repercussions. My fake email flooded with replies and I eventually found one that was what I was looking for, I think I understand your situation, and you can count on me to be discreet. We met at a coffee shop several miles out of town. For the sake of this hookup, his name was Daryl, but I didn't believe him and didn't care. For the sake of the hookup, my name was Carla. He was dreamy and slightly younger than my real age, we had nothing in common, but he assured me that he was 7 inches hard and that he would rock my world. We went to his clean apartment and I psyched myself up for a good pounding. My heart was racing, my arms were both tingling, and I was all like, I'm actually going to come and it's going to be awesome. I hadn't been this wet since my disappointing wedding night. I love my husband very very much, but you have to understand he's really really bad at sex. I've never told him that, of course, but I've lost count of the number of times I've told him outright, I need to try something different. He's never interested. He actually thinks I get my orgasms from lying on my back for 3 minutes while he pumps his pelvis into me with the gusto of a masturbating teenager. So Daryl led the way to his bedroom and asked if I'd like to first admire his collection of hunting knives. They really complete him and anyone who wants to be with him has to appreciate them for what they are and what they represent. I was young once and knew some weird dudes, so I wasn't that phased. I was more impatient to come than anything, one enjoyable indulgence and then I could go back home, and if it worked out, maybe try it with another guy, or maybe I would learn something here that I could teach to Casey to make him better at sex. I got this one from an artisan in Mexico, said Daryl, who had taken off his shirt. He handed me what looked like a boring knife that I really didn't care about. Fascinating, I cajoled, and I put in back in its case, and I removed my skirt, showing off a cute pair of black lace panties that dare I say, would have rocked my ass when I was 30. Turn around, said Daryl. Casey never ever told me to turn around. I did as I was told. My, what a lovely ass you have said Daryl. Casey never complimented my body. Daryl had been at least three body lengths away from me, but with silent speed, he had traveled our gap and spanked me savagely on my left cheek. Casey had never spanked me, even when I asked him to. Daryl, I said, nervously, I have a secretary boss fantasy, where I get punished for dropping all the pens. Carla, you read my mind, said Daryl. Let me just get one thing. So I sat impatiently on his bed while he left the room to get the one thing. I'm not a monster, I love my husband and our children. Little voices whispered in my head to stop this infidelity, but there was no way I was leaving without an orgasm. I had been patient for far too long. Daryl returned to the bedroom, wearing rubber gloves. What for, I couldn't possible have imagined until he grabbed his Mexican artisan knife and stabbed himself repeatedly in the stomach, yelling, I hate you, Gene, before slashing the glove off his left and tearing off the other with his right hand and dying the floor, blood spilling from more than a dozen slashes and stab holes. I would love to have stopped him, but I was frozen shocked and the thought of actually moving my body to save him completely escaped me, so here I was, the only witness to a s where the victim had worn gloves while using a weapon that had my fingerprints on them as he yelled my real name. If I had tried to stop him, would he have stabbed me? I phoned the police immediately. They showed up in 10 minutes and asked me what happened. I was humiliated and filled with shame. I obviously had never intended to get caught cheating, and here I was, 
explaining to complete strangers that I was cheating on my husband with a stranger I'd met on the internet, while a million emotions swam through my traumatized mind as I cried. Most of the cops I dealt with were men and they were all wearing wedding rings. They made little effort to hide their judgment of me and I didn't blame them. I wanted to go home and snuggle with Casey. I wanted to go back in time and never place that stupid ad in the first place. Despite my sexual unfulfillment, I had never been truly unhappy with my life. I had been so ungrateful. Where does your husband think you are right now? Was the only question that resounded within, amidst the dozens of other questions involving a man who had stabbed himself in front of me. Casey was on a business trip, earning money for his family, like a good husband is wont to do. Casey's out of the country and doesn't know where I am, I replied. And your children? Asked the detective. My sweet babies. I couldn't bear the shame they would feel if they ever found out about this. They would never have forgiven me. They're at our house and I told them I was helping a co-worker put together boxes to facilitate a move, I answered. Had you ever met this man before? A detective asked me. Not until tonight, I answered, still wondering how the hell Daryl had known my real name. His real name was Ivan Karen, said the detective, and a wave of shock hit me as my final year of high school flashed before my eyes. Ivan Karen had had an insane crush on me, but he was 14 while I was 18 and I had zero interest in him. He was awkward and kept trying to impress me by telling me how hard his life was and how different he was than everyone else. From what he told me, it was more like complaining than anything else. He had a supportive family and equally weird friends who were into the same weird things. I wasn't a cool kid in school or anything, but I definitely thought I was too cool for Ivan. We had nothing in common and he was always telling me that I would be a better person if I shared his interests in poorly written fantasy novels and atonal soundscapes. He asked me out more than 10 times until I agreed to go out with him, with the intent of being lame on purpose so that he might lose interest in me. On the night of our date, I changed my mind and phoned his house, only he wasn't there, so I stood him up completely. The next day at school, I told him that I just wasn't interested and asked him to never talk to me again. It was high school. I'm not proud of it how I treated him. I had no idea I had affected him this much. Had he been thinking of me while I was in university? Was he hung up on me this whole time I was in a frustrating marriage, living my entire adult life with nothing to do with him? Was it fate that made him reply to that Craigslist ad? How could he have known it was me? He had looked so handsome and capable of interesting things. Had we ever crossed paths on the street? Had he ever recognized me? Why did he waste his life thinking of someone who never bothered to think of him? Keep your phone on you, one of the detectives said to me, a few hours later, at a police station where the coffee was terrible and I wasn't allowed to smoke any cigarettes. They made it clear that I wasn't under arrest but that I had to stay in the city until told otherwise. For the next few weeks, I was the only suspect in his death, as my fingerprints were all over the weapon, but they eventually decided I was innocent and ruled Ivan's death as a S. Casey never found out, but I'll never forget how I nearly fainted when Casey said casually one morning, Ivan Karen killed himself. He was in high school with your sister. Did you know him? Not really, I answered casually, hoping to never speak of the matter again. A great sex life would be wonderful, but for the moment, I'll be thankful for what I've got. I won't place another ad anywhere for anything. Casey is wonderful, our kids are wonderful, and I will never do anything again that could jeopardize the life we have together. I just hope Casey gets better at sex, but with my luck, he'll just go impotent. About four years ago, one of my long-time friends on DeviantArt sent me an urgent message telling me to check out a profile of a user I'll call clowns be clowning to protect his identity. The creepy thing about this DeviantArt profile was that it was basically a shrine to me. It had details about my life on it that only people who knew me personally or had been following the journals on my various websites would be aware of. 
I read through this guy's personal journal on the profile section of his page and let's just say there was some disturbing stuff posted on it. There were hundreds of pictures of me, where he got them, I have no idea as I only let close friends view my pictures on my personal Facebook page, and underneath the pictures he would list creepy things like I'm always watching you and I want to wear your skin. He also would post links to my writing, art, and music websites and tell people to watch me because I was an angel, was perfect, and everyone should be like me. I was basically a religion to this guy that he was even going so far as to try to convert people to. It is one of the strangest things I have ever encountered, and I was terrified when I read everything though. I told my mom about the DeviantArt user and she told me that we should report it to the police so we went to the station to give an official statement. The police turned out to be pretty useless, stating that we should take our issue to the website administrators, basically the DeviantArt staff, and have them resolve the issue from their end. So I contacted one of the admins on DeviantArt who was so freaked out by the profile they literally responded to my message the next day, telling me they had deleted the profile as soon as they saw it. Anyone who uses DeviantArt is aware that the staff usually takes a week or so to get back to you about an issue, so that just gives you an idea of what a freak this user was. The staff member told me to also report the user to the police, which I said I had with no results. So they took the extra step and banned the user's IP and even checked to see if he had made any shadow accounts on the site. They deleted everything related to this guy, but I still have a printout of what I took to the police which I keep filed with the police report. I don't know who that guy was, but I hope that I will never have to find a creepy page like that on DeviantArt. Or any other site for that matter. Ever again. So years ago, early 2013 or so I had been looking for someone to date online. I had a couple of ads on Craigslist. I had had success of sorts off of that website with dating in the past, so I was trying again. I remember just writing a little about myself and asking for something like a unique date idea or a story or something like that. A number of guys messaged me, but no one really stood out at all. I replied to most of the emails I got and I believe I wasn't using the relay system at the time because I figured it was just an email address, what was the harm in that? As you can see where I've posted this story, obviously I was wrong about that. So a guy eventually messages me asking all these various questions about me. He seemed to know a lot more information about me though than I had ever divulged on Craigslist. He knew things like old usernames I had used in the past and even described my appearance which I had not even posted. He told me he knew where I worked and would like to meet me someday. I got really creeped out by all of this. I had no idea where he had gotten this information from and him knowing what I looked like was scary as well especially since he supposedly knew where I worked. I blocked him and ended up taking down the ad. Then one day at work, I worked for a major retailer in a very bad part of an already crime-ridden city. A man came up to me and asked if I was this old username I had forever ago. I went pale and felt my legs turn to jello. There was no way that anyone out there would ever know to associate me with that username. I said no and that I didn't know what he was talking about. He went on to describe other details about me which I later figured out were available on my old MySpace page I hadn't used in forever. When I got home later, I logged into that account and deleted just about everything about myself on that site. I kept denying everything he asked about and he eventually gave up and I hurried off to another area in the store. I was terrified to go home after that and if I remember correctly I had a co-worker walk me out to my car. I never did see that guy again after that and I sure hope I never will. I live in another state now, so it's not likely he'd ever find me out here. Probably the worst experience for me. I had one aftermarket wheel for a truck I had, and had decided to go a different route so I was selling the one new wheel. Guy emails me about buying it for his son, said he was buying a whole set. We agreed on a price, I think $200, and I paid an extra $50 to ship it to him. I was just tired of the wheel taking up space. 
We agree that he'll just send me a money order in the mail the next day. So the next day I ship the wheel. He gives me a phone call the next week after the will arrives wondering why I sent it. Turns out he couldn't come up with the money and didn't think I actually sent it after I said I did. I was so fed up and didn't feel like bothering to pay for shipping to get it back so I just said for him to have a good Christmas and not worry about it. He was very thankful and said it was going to make his son's Christmas, I don't know how since it was just one will but whatever. It was Kylie's idea to celebrate our mutual college graduations and to say goodbye. And it was Jenna who offered up her family's cabin for our last hurrah. So the five of us packed up Jenna's old Winnebago with enough food for an army and probably twice as much beer. The plan for that weekend was pretty simple, we were going to have the time of our lives and get shit-faced drunk while doing it. Unfortunately for us, the Friday that we left a brewing storm let loose, and rain mercilessly pounded the vehicle. Then, around mile marker 330, one of the RV's tires blew out. The vehicle skidded off the road and into a clearing. We were lucky we'd avoided hitting any fir trees. Is everybody okay? Jenna asked, her hands gripping the wheel. Everyone was understandably shaken, but we checked for injuries and other than a few bruises, everyone seemed fine. Kylie got out her iPhone and muttered, I think I got a signal. 13 minutes later she confirmed a tow truck had been dispatched, but there was one problem. It won't be here for a few hours, Kylie lamented. F, Stacy murmured. As we put the RV back in order, refilling cabinets with the supplies that had tumbled out, the rain stopped. It was just us, the dense woods, and the gentle rumble of thunder in the distance. Jesus, it's getting cold and it'll be sundown soon. Maybe we should make camp here while we wait for the tow truck, I suggested. Sure. Couldn't be worse than in here, Jenna muttered. Everyone hopped out of the RV and began searching for a flat area to set up some chairs. Over here, Stacy called. I made my way over to see she'd found a spot that gave us a glimpse of the road so we could keep watch for our would-be rescuers. Stacy, Michelle and Jenna grabbed the chairs and beer, while Kylie and I searched for firewood. Once we made it back to the clearing, I built the campfire. I think I was the only one with any real outdoor experience. We pulled up our chairs as tight as they would go around the fire. Crickets serenaded us in apparent harmony with the crackling flames. The cool air left by the wake of the storm carried with it the smells of damp earth and the tang of burning wood. This hiccup in our plan was turning out to be quite nice after all. Hey! We should tell some spooky stories, said Jenna as she handed out beers. Kylie shrugged. It'll make time go by faster. Jenna smiled wider and said, cool. I'll go first. Twilight had faded into night and the storm clouds had cleared enough to give us a view of the twinkling stars. Jenna pointed a flashlight up to her mouth for dramatic effect. Once upon a time, five people were camping in the woods. Oh, that's original, Stacy interrupted. Jenna glared at her and then continued, the five friends were enjoying the campfire. Until a strong gust of wind blew the fire out. We all looked at the campfire, as though an odd wind would suddenly extinguish the flames. Jenna grinned, obviously thrilled by our uneasiness. One of them set off into the gloomy forest to retrieve more firewood. Only one of them set off into the gloomy forest? Asked Stacy. Oh, please. Jenna rolled her eyes. Fine. Two of them went to get more firewood. The other three huddled together in the utter darkness making jokes to soften the situation. Suddenly, Footsteps approached the campsite. Turning their heads, they saw a shadowy figure walking out of the woods carrying something. Thinking it was one of their friends, they laughed at the lame attempt to creep them out. Slowly, they realized their friend wasn't coming any closer. They screamed in terror as they saw. Then she stopped. That's it? Stacy asked. Jenna brought the flashlight up to her chin again and said in the silliest ghoulish voice, to be continued. We all laughed. It felt good to be goofy together one last time. Hey, have you gals heard of the campfire ritual? 
asked Kylie. Given the blank stares on all of our faces, it was obvious that we hadn't. So, basically, we have to give an offering to the fire, something that is special to us personally. Then we each tell the scariest, most messed up thing we ever experienced. The idea is the stuff we did won't come back to haunt us because we did the ritual. The rest of us looked at each other incredulously. Did you find that on a stupid Reddit forum or something? Stacy asked. Oh give her a break. It's worth a shot. Maybe it can grant us wishes, Jenna suggested with a giggle. I don't know about granting wishes, but I'm all for not being haunted. Michelle reached into her purse and pulled out a glittery blue bookmark. I got this from my little brother. He said the sparkles reminded him of my necklace I always wear. She held on to it for a second before placing it into the burning flames. Her expression turned serious. Michelle let the silence play out for a few seconds, just enough to rattle the rest of us. What I'm about to share with you happened to me and my boyfriend. She made an exaggerated show of looking around and frowning. In fact, the story I'm about to tell occurred right around here. I'm already calling bullshit, said Stacy, tossing her blonde hair over her shoulder. If I didn't know better, I'd think she was already spooked. She glanced at the darkening woods behind us and shivered. Yep. She was spooked, alright. Don't be rude, Stacy, said Kylie. Well, it's not like any of us have been up here before. This is the first time Jenna's ever invited us to her family's cabin. Jenna poked Stacy on the arm. If you don't shut up so help me she warned. Stacy rolled her eyes. Fine. Michelle shot Jenna a grateful look. We were headed to his family's lakeside cabin for a weekend getaway. It was getting dark, much like it is right now, and it started to rain. Josh was driving fast and I kept telling him to slow down. I thought you were the lead foot, said Jenna. Yeah, I teased. How many speeding tickets have you gotten in the last year? Do you want me to tell the story or not? Asked Michelle, obviously irritated. Jenna and I shared a look and then I waved at our friend to continue her tale. A woman appeared right in front of the car's headlights. Josh slammed on his brakes, but it was too late. He pulled to the shoulder and backed up to the spot where he'd hit the woman. We got out of the car and ran to the middle of the road, but... Michelle sat back and stared at the flickering flames. No one was there. I would shit myself, said Stacy. We almost did said Michelle with a small smile. I was ready to turn around and get the hell back to town. But Josh says the lake is only a few minutes away and it'll take longer to get home. Eventually he gets me to calm down. The rustle of animals in the forest behind us has quieted and even the crickets have stopped singing. Like the whole forest was listening to the story. I have to admit my skin prickled with goosebumps. We keep driving, said Michelle, her voice low. We all lean in to catch her words. And the woman appears in the headlights for a second time. Josh doesn't stop. He drives straight through until we reach the cabin. We scramble out of the car. Safety is within reach. But before we get to the door the woman appears on the porch. Her once pretty face is mangled and her flowered dress hangs in ratty strips from her gaunt frame. She's as pale as the moon. She points a bony finger at us and says. Michelle leapt from her chair and yelled, Boo! We all screamed. Even me. That was so cheesy, exclaimed Stacy. You jumped, I told her. Just like the rest of us. I'm not scared, she said. You should be. Michelle looked off into the distance. This whole area is cursed. Her expression was solemn. I didn't think Michelle had that good of a poker face, so I think she was telling the truth. We really did see a woman in the headlights, she murmured. Yeah, right, said Stacy, though I detected a tremor in her voice. We did, said Michelle, straight-faced. Only, we all stared at her. She shrugged. She didn't yell boo, okay? She didn't say anything at all. But she did point at us. We got back in the car and Josh took me home. I never saw him again. What a douchebag, said Jenna, her voice flat. He didn't even call you? No, 
said Michelle. He committed S. What? The. Actual. F. Said Stacy. You're not serious, Michelle. Michelle didn't respond to Stacy's outrage. Instead, she relaxed into her chair and took a long drink of beer. Think you can do better? Of course I can, Stacy scoffed. She reached into her bag and pulled out a ribbon. I got this from a cancer patient during my hospital internship. Tossing it into the fire, we all watched as the flames engulfed the delicate pink fabric. I've been around a lot of sick, dying people during my time at the hospital, but nothing made me question my choice of major like the six-week stint I did in palliative care. Stacy paused, taking a moment to look at each one of us. She lowered her voice. I never told anyone what I'm sharing with you now. After hearing their stories of survival only to find their beds empty days later. It messed me up. I actually spent some time talking with the hospital's therapist. She stared into the fire while we all glanced at each other, shocked at the quiet vulnerability of our otherwise abrasive friend. So let me guess, Jenna said with a stilted laugh, breaking the uncomfortable silence, a call light came on in a room that someone died in, or no. A shadowy figure was seen on the security cameras, or. No, Stacy said softly, nothing like that. A resuscitated patient told me I was going to die. That is messed up, I admit it. Almost everyone who comes there has said their goodbyes and signed their DNRs. They don't want to be saved so they can spend more days suffering. She shook her head. But there was this young mom, maybe around 35, with advanced breast cancer who refused to accept her situation. It would be inspiring if it weren't so sad. Stacy smiled as she reached up and stroked the locks of her own golden hair. She was beautiful once. Before she became the bald, gray, titless dried up thing that I knew, hoping against the inevitable. Her family made their peace, but she said she wanted every moment possible with her kids. She inhaled deeply. I think it was selfish of her. Making her kids see her like that. They knew she was going to die. It's almost like she was torturing her family. I saw her gaze land on the curl of ash that had once been the pink ribbon. Anyway, she coded one night, three times in a row, and I was there for the third. We were into our eighth minute of CPR and beyond ready to call it, when she suddenly took a huge breath of air. Stacy stood up quickly, knocking her chair over and gasping so loudly it echoed off the nearby pines. Every one of us flinched, our eyes widening. The pace of her words quickened. The staff backed away in fear. Her face revealed pure terror and she let out this slow, clicking exhale while looking around the room wildly. Stacy mimicked the expression and unnerving sound, craning her neck and twitching her head to look at each of us. The woman raised her skeletal arm and pointed a limp finger directly at me, she said, doing the same motion toward Jenna. With a raspy voice and eerily wide eyes, Stacy moaned, you are going to die. She held the last syllable until her lungs were completely empty of breath. Silence again surrounded the campfire. I abandoned my beer and grabbed a stick to stoke the fire. Really, I was trying to hide how disturbed I felt. So, then what happened? Kylie asked. Stacy plopped into her chair. I don't know. I got the hell out of there and she died a couple days later. You think she saw something while she was dead? Kylie asked as she tapped on her phone screen, obviously distracted. That's what I've wondered, Stacy said. But all I know is her voice still echoes in my mind. Well, Stace, Michelle said, I gotta hand it to you. Your story was all kinds of messed up. And no jump scare or anything. What can I say? I'm awesome. Stacy rolled her empty beer contoured Kylie and it bounced off her foot. Hey! Were you even listening? No, no, that was scary, Kylie admitted as she looked up. Well, maybe you should go next. But don't offer your phone for the ritual, Stacy teased, we may need it if the tow truck doesn't show up soon. How much longer do you think it'll be? I asked. It's only been an hour, said Jenna. We have a lot more time to kill. Ha, ha, said Stacy. 
Jenna waved her hand dismissively. I didn't mean it like that. Well, while Kylie takes her precious time, why don't you go Mel? I, I don't have one, I whispered. What? That's bullshit, you have to know at least one, said Stacy. You have at least one scary experience. You sure Mel? Kylie asked. The look she gave was bizarre. Fine, then let me tell you about the most horrific thing that happened to me. Kylie put her phone down. Do you know what it's like to see the person you love the most suffering and know there's nothing you can do to help them? To want more than anything in the universe to take that pain from them, and be unable to? Can you imagine the anguish you'd feel seeing the happiness and light slowly fade from their eyes, until one day it's entirely snuffed out? Do you? I glanced around the fire, realizing everyone's faces were as pale and nervous as mine. Jenna caught my eye and her lower lip trembled slightly before she looked away. I tried to slow my breathing as I dug my nails into my palms. My older sister also had cancer, Kylie stood up and walked to Stacy. She stroked our friend's hair. Only, she didn't suddenly die like the woman in your story. No. Her nurse was too terrified to look at her anymore and decided to pull the plug. She didn't even get to say goodbye to her family. Stacy's mouth dropped as she stuttered to find words. But there were none. Kylie, I said, trying to soothe her anger. Stacy's terrified gaze met mine, but I looked away. I didn't know what to do, so I did nothing. F this, no more waiting, Jenna smiled through her tears as she pulled out a gun. We've been planning this for months now. It's time we finally get our revenge. She passed the gun to Kylie who took a step forward causing Stacy, Michelle, and I to jump up from our seats. Her and Jenna were quickly backing us into a corner. Mel, do something, Stacy cried. I moved like lightning and grabbed Michelle by the throat, pinning her down and choking her as she struggled to breathe. The woman you ran over that night, the one who was trying to wave down a vehicle for help because her car broke down. That was my mother you bitch. I whispered as the life went out of her eyes. Before Stacy had a chance to react, the sound of gunfire pierced the night. I looked to my left in time to see Stacy hit the ground and blood gurgle from her mouth. Jenna made her way over to Michelle and I, bending down real close to her ear. Good thing you did the campfire ritual huh? We carried them to the RV, putting Stacy in the driver's seat and Michelle on the passenger side. As we buckled in their limp bodies, I patted Michelle's cheek. It's a real shame that me, Kylie, and Jenna couldn't make this trip. We had to hole up in the school library until the wee hours studying for finals. I let you borrow my Winnebago and gave you the keys to my family's cabin, said Jenna as she dragged the last of the camp chairs inside. It's such a shame you two died right before graduation. It's no wonder you drove over the embankment. You shouldn't drink and drive, said Kylie as she put crushed beer cans into the trash. By the time they find you, you will be as sober as the dead though. If they find you, said Jenna. I mean, nobody will report you missing until Monday. She put the vehicle in neutral. We pushed the RV over the embankment to make it look like an accident and dropped a few lit matches down with for good measure. Stacy may have still been alive. We walked down the road like frightened hitchhikers, and told a different story to each driver that gave us a ride. By the time we were done, it was a different tale entirely. Just remember, if you and your friends ever ask about the campfire ritual, make sure you don't want the story to come true. Unless, of course, that was your plan all along. Thanks for watching. Be sure to subscribe for daily stories. We at Horror Den of Misfits really enjoy this, and your support would be appreciated.